Okay, here we go again. Need more lighting for when I'm doing watercolors. Oops. Let's see if I can get this situated in a good way. Hi everyone again. Part two, yeah. So like I said earlier, I actually don't know what colors I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm not going to get very far right now because I need to figure that out. <laughs> and sometimes I just need a little quiet time for that to happen. So I have my color chart because while I was familiar with my old set, I'm not, I haven't actually used this yet, so I don't really... Not quite familiar with all of my colors and where they are yet. What lid top am I using this go around for my watercolor pots? Um, which which lid top do you refer to? And what kind of light am I using? I. I'm not sure the brand of my light. <laughs> I'll have to look that up later, but I'll put it in the notes for this when I archive later. So one of the things, oh, actually, first thing I usually do, you know, so normally the first thing I do with my sketch is I take a clean water brush and I just brush over everything. And that sort of fixes the graphite a bit so that it doesn't get so smeary. But I'm considering not doing a background on this one and just leaving it white so that it's a vignette piece because like I said, this is going to be the cover and there's gonna be a title and stuff going on over here. So because I'm not sure and I'm leaning towards having a white background, I'm not going to do the water thing because that sometimes does a little subtle, um, subtle coloration or modeling of the texture. So I don't want that to happen. But the second thing I do is I try to get rid of some of the excess graphite in the regions where I am going to be painting initially. So I like to use a kneaded eraser for that because I could just press it. And some, sometimes what I do instead is I roll it into a log shape like this. And then you can just sort of roll it across to evenly pick up some of the graphite and lighten things up. What do I have my pants sitting in? Oh, that's just a, it's, it's a, uh, let me see if I can find one that is not in use right now. I, I made them. They are just cut from, they're, they're laser cut acrylic and I just have a clear bottom piece and a, a lip around the edge and that just, prevents spills from completely getting all over everything because I am messy and <laughs> I spill stuff frequently, which freaks other people out, but it actually doesn't freak me out nearly as much, it, except for when I do it on a botanical painting <laughs> because those are ones where I don't want random smeary things to happen. But for my other paintings, I am actually okay when things get messy like that. I 
but I, I shaped this one specifically to be able to curve around the area where I am painting. That's why it has such an odd shape. So it's specifically shaped for my mini palettes and to frame the areas that I am working on so that I can have all of my colors in a very close vicinity to where I am working. Do I have a favorite watercolor brand? So I do, but I use multiple brands. I don't actually stick to any one in particular. I, I do, most of what I have here is Daniel Smith, but I also have Holbein and Renaissance and Winsor Newton, and what else is what I have? I think I have like four different brands here. I'm trying to remember which ones. So Daniel Smith, Renaissance, Holbein. Um, I can't remember what the fourth one is. <laughs> I think if you if you go to my last week's live session so I, I did two I did the main painting session at six o'clock but then later that evening I, I did a secondary one in the evening or well, later in the evening where I was filling up this watercolor palette and if you watch that then you can see the entire list of what I've got. I'll, I'll put together a written list of it as well because I always have people asking about that. But I think Primarily what I've got in this in this palette is Daniel Smith. That's that's the predominant Brand that I am using these days and have been for quite some time There are a few handmade watercolor um, small batch things that I also enjoy using but because those tend to be in pans. Uh, I don't have them here. So these are all my tube, my favorite tube paint colors. And yeah, I use, I use a lot of Artistic Isle for the shimmery stuff. I like how smooth her colors are and how they, they blend really well with the way I use watercolors in general. So some, I've tried a few different shimmery brands and some of them, they're a little bit too glittery and have more particles or they don't really blend into my watercolor techniques. And so they, they kind of stand out rather than becoming integrated and being a part of it. Why do I paint watercolor and not acrylic or oil? I paint in watercolor because I love transparency. I love the beautiful layers, the, the beauty that you can achieve by layering colors gradually and, and building up tone. And you can do that with oils and acrylics as well, but I just enjoy the process of it much better with watercolors. And, and then secondly, I, I don't have a huge studio space to work in. And 
so I, I don't really want to work with toxic fumes and things that are involved with oils. I did do acrylics once upon a time. Actually, I've done both. I've done oils and I've done acrylics. But I, I just really fell in love with watercolors as soon as I started using them. Well, I, I mean, I used them as a kid, but I used them seriously for the first time when I was, oh, this was back in 1998 was the first time I, I took on watercolors and looked at them as a serious artist medium. Because prior to that, when I was in school, uh, we weren't even allowed to use watercolors <laughs> because the, the, well, I went to Berkeley and it was a abstract expressionism program and they did not like watercolors or gouache. We were told in painting class that you can pick any medium to work with, they told us, any medium, except for watercolor. <laughs> Which at the time for me was fine because I didn't really consider watercolor an option either. Uh, although I, I did think it was kind of funny that they said any medium you want except for watercolor. Which what they really meant was any medium you want as long as it's either acrylic or oils. Is this a size 2 brush? No, this is a size 0 brush. So I'm doing a first under layer of the feathers along the neck of this phoenix with quinquadrone gold and quinquadrone deep gold. Yay, I can tell you what the names of the colors are again because I lost my I lost my uh, color chart for my last palette and so I knew where everything was in my dish. I, I knew the colors visually but I didn't know what the names were because I hadn't looked at them in so long and I didn't know what was where. So people would ask me, what color is that? And I'd say, uh, it's a yellowish orange color. Now I can tell you exactly which one it is because I have this handy in front of me. Do I seal my paintings when I'm done? I seal paintings only if they have copper leaf in it because that would oxidize if it's not or if I'm planning to do my resin coating on them because then I need to have it sealed before I can apply a, a, a resin to it that's going to take at minimum five hours to set Uh, and, and also now sometimes when I'm, if I'm using a larger amount of shimmery pigments, then I'm also sealing those sometimes just to make sure that the shimmery stuff doesn't rub off. But most of the time, as long as the painting is going to be protected behind matting and glass, it's, it's not something that you need to worry about too much. New Mexico wildflowers says, ha, huh, when I was in art school, watercolor was never, watercolor was for prep sketches or color theory, never for finished work. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we had. Only no one cared about color theory. <laughs> no, no one cared about color theory or sketch, sketch prep work. Because that was, 
that was the kind of program I was in. <laughs> so yeah, no one wanted watercolors. So I, I kind of stumbled on watercolors on my own after, after I left college. Um, and, and I had been doing a lot of acrylic and digital on my own time. Did, uh, so I was doing acrylic in my coursework and, and as well for my personal work. And, and I was also playing around a lot digitally because I was using Photoshop, which was a brand new and amazing thing. Photoshop 1.0. And I wanted to work for game companies. And when I submitted my art to Wizards of the Coast, I was told by the art director to come back to him when I had a portfolio with a real medium. And I happened to be wandering around in San Francisco not long after that with my uncle who is also an artist, very different sort of artist for me. He works in a lot of public installations is what he creates. He works mostly in the Pacific Northwest area, Portland. Uh, Horatio Law is his name. He was always a, a big influence on me as, as seeing someone who was making a living as an artist when I was young. Uh, although, like I said, he does very different art from what I do because he, he mostly does installation work and sort of community-oriented projects that involve, uh, involve the whole community in, in creating these installation-type pieces. Anyway, he was, he was with me in San Francisco and we were wandering about and we came across a gallery show that had these beautiful watercolor paintings. And I remember that being the first time where I looked at watercolor paintings and realized that they could be so vibrant and that they could be a medium that would be taken seriously and, and that could create such beautiful things. And so that that week, I went to Pearl Art Supplies, which is no longer, I don't think they exist any longer. I think Dick Blick has taken over all the Pearl locations. There used to be one in San Francisco and one in New York City. And anyway, I went to Pearl because I was living in San Francisco at the time. And I got myself a set of Winsor Newton Cotton and Watercolors, which is their semi-professional student grade of paints. And I started a couple of paintings using those. And I just fell in love with the beautiful transparency of watercolors. And I, I realized that the techniques that I had been employing with acrylics because I, I was already sort of doing this transparent layering uh, with acrylics and I realized suddenly that watercolors were so much more well suited to working that way and that they were a natural medium for that kind of stuff and so rather than try to force acrylics to work in that way, I, I could just switch over to using watercolors instead. So that was sort of the start of my love of watercolors. Let's see, what did I miss over here in the chat while I was babbling on? being told anything but watercolor would make me instantly want to do nothing but watercolor forever. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that was a little bit of the way it was for me, although it wasn't, my reaction wasn't so much watercolor, it was with digital because um, the professors also equally, no, I think they hated digital even more 
than watercolor. <laughs> and in, in fact, when I went to the advisors, so I was doing a double major and I, I did computer science as well as art. And I, I went to both the advisors for, I went to the advisor for computer science and I went to the advisor for art and I asked them both, you know, because I wanted to do some independent study coursework. I wanted to somehow integrate these two, these two areas that I was working in and create some kind of course of study for myself out of it. And I literally got laughed out of the room by both of them in, in two separate, you know, conferences. <laughs> the, the computer science career advisor told me, this is stupid. Why would you ever want to integrate art into computer science stuff or computer work? That doesn't make any sense. And the art advisor was similarly as disparaging and hated the idea. <laughs> so I quickly discarded that and decided that if I was going to do anything of the sort, it would have to be on my own and in my own time. What else did I miss? Uh, I was blown away the first time I used real watercolor paints, not kid paints. Yeah, real real watercolors versus kid paints is, is such a big difference. There's just no comparison. <laughs> it's like it's like using crayons versus um, like Prismacolor watercolor uh, Prismacolor uh, colored pencils or something. You know, you can't. The, the quality of the art supply is such a completely different experience. I've heard Daniel Smith's Rhodonite Genuine oxidizes brown, so if you use that color you might want to seal that too. Yeah, I don't think I use that color. I don't, I'm pretty sure I don't have that here. What product do I use to seal? I pick some watercolor um, spray fixative and take my paintings outside and spray them down. And I wear a mask while doing that. And yeah, you don't want to breathe in that stuff. been wanting to ask if you use ink pencils in your work as well as brushes. No, I do not. I just use watercolors and brushes. Yeah, it sounds like back in the day when beauty was a bad thing, says Charles. And yes, it totally was. I remember being in critiques uh, when we had finished our, our pieces and, you know, we'd get together at the class and everyone would put You'd put your, your piece up for 15 minutes and everyone in the class would get to have their say about it. And two of the biggest insults that someone could throw at a piece of art was that it was pretty and secondarily that it was illustrative. <laughs> and it was, I remember thinking how how shocking it was that freshmen, and, and I was a freshman at the time, learned to say le learned to say those things with such a such a sneer in their voices. You know, it's it's illustrative. <laughs> At how quickly everyone was ingrained into that way of thinking and. Um, disregarding a whole set of ideals for art, <laughs> which was why I, I would just go home and I, I did all my, I did all the stuff for the courses. I did the abstract, strange, weird stuff. Um, 
didn't touch watercolors or digital things while I was in my classes and then I would go home and draw the D&D &D characters for my my dorm mates with pen and ink and digital digitally colored and it was fun <laughs> and I would go wake up and go to classes and, and do the thing that the teachers wanted me to do instead and so I got I got to explore, I think, because I, I got to do, I got to do the things that, that I wanted to do on the side, but I also did my best to try and do, you know, this, this abstract thing and to play around with texture and to play around with, with form and color the way we were encouraged to for our, our coursework. And, and so another, another thing I remember thinking when I, when I finished with my degree there was that I felt like everyone else there had, had pretty much closed off their, their mind to a whole area of art while I instead got to challenge and open myself up to something that was completely out of my comfort zone and and I feel like that stuff as strange as it may seem if you were to look at what I did then and what everyone in my all, all of my classmates were doing then and and what the teachers were encouraging us to do it's so different from the art that I do now but at the same time I think my love of of the random and the textures and chaos, I think that it stems from having been exposed to that and, and forcing myself to play with those areas that I was not comfortable with dealing with and really trying that stuff out. And yeah, so Charles is saying also, you know, he spent 30 years as a programmer before coming back to art and the art as antithetical as people think. And I, I completely agree with you. I feel like a lot of what I do with my art making in, in the way I look for patterns and in the way I, I solve problems in compositions and in shaping the the story of my of my paintings i think i think that those are all elements that are not at odds with the very logical part of my mind that does actually enjoy computer programming i mean i don't want to do it as my career for my life but i i don't dislike programming <laughs> i actually do have fun with it and so it's it's interesting to me to see these two sides of myself and how they resolve with each other in the form of my art and in what I create. And I don't think that they are completely at odds. I agree with you completely, Stephen. Oh, Charles, sorry. <laughs> what paper am I using here? I am using Moulin de Roy. 300 pound hot press watercolor paper, but as I warn everyone these days, because I get asked about the paper all the time, uh, don't don't fall in love with it because it is is being discontinued. <laughs> it can be found still in stores, but it will not last because Canson is no longer making it. So I don't have a new paper yet to recommend to people because I myself have stocked up on Moulin de Roy, so hopefully it's going to last me a few years. <laughs> and in the meantime, I'll be on the lookout to try new papers, but I have not yet bothered to do that because I love Moulin de Roy and I am very happy with it and I am going to put my head down and just go through my stock of it for now. <laughs> I 
Hello everyone new who has joined in recently. Yeah, I, I always put a list of all the materials and things that I have used in these videos in the archived version that I get that gets posted into my IGTV. So if you have questions about anything that you see that I'm using here, I will have the links for it later uh, after this live session is done. It usually takes me a few minutes to post it, so just, just check back later afterwards if you are curious about anything. And if, if you want to make sure that I don't forget to list something, just toss it out here in the chat right now so that I, I know that you are curious about any particular item. Is Canson not making paper at all or just not Moulin de Roy? They are still making paper, so you don't have to worry about that in general, but they are not making Moulin de Roy. And in fact, they have not, I think, for at least a year. I only found out that it was discontinued via someone, someone on my Patreon mentioned it like a, a month or two ago because I, I was not aware that it was discontinued because you could still buy it at stores. Although it made sense after I found that out because I actually could not get it ordered at my local stores and I was only able to buy it online. And I remember checking with all my local stores and asking if they could order it and they said no. And I didn't think to question why. <laughs> Oh, thanks so much. I'm so glad that you like Mondays. <laughs> I'm glad to brighten your day with these. Yeah, the discontinued Moulin de Roy makes me sad, too. <laughs> Do you use it also, Sam, or are you just sad because you, you won't get to use and love it? <laughs> so I go back and forth with layers, building things up like this. And I, I start with sort of the texture of the feathers, and then I hit it with a wash of color, sometimes of a more, sometimes of a more dilute orange and yellow, and sometimes I've been using like the bluish green up there. I like the contrast of the orange versus the teal. I like those two colors against each other. It's it's a color combination I've been using frequently for my Phoenix paintings. Yeah, well, Sam, if you if you like the Moulin de Roy, you can, like I said, you can still buy it. It's still available. So if, if you think that you like it, you should grab up some while you can. I think what I was told for the reason, and, and I'm just spreading speculation here, <laughs> so don't take this as absolute truth, but I think what I was told for the reason why it's discontinued is that the, the factory where it was made is just no longer producing, or the mill, the mill where it is made. So they have a, a supposed replacement paper for the Moulin de Roy, but the one person I know who's tried it says that it was not, that it did not perform the same as the can as the Moulin de Roy. So that is disappointing to hear.
what type of hot press paper this is uh, as as i've been saying just now it's the kensin Mulanderoy, which is discontinued so don't fall in love with it unless you want to buy a big stockpile of it right now <laughs> curious about the brush yeah this is these are handmade brushes. Tracy Levinson makes them and I will definitely drop the link as well for that later on. This one is the Stiff White Synthetic and I, I really enjoy both using his brushes and just how they feel and as well as how they look. They're just so pretty. Bamboo handles. But this one, so it's the, it's the three quarter inch small stiff synthetic and it's about the size of a, a size two brush. brush is beautiful, much like the Chinese calligraphy brush I was given with the incredible fine point. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you saw my video last week when I was working on the thistle painting, but I, I was actually showing some, a, a little taste of Chinese brush technique with one of the brushes I was using last week uh, instead, because those those are much more similar to the feel of the Chinese calligraphy brushes. This one is the, it's a synthetic and goat hair blend, but it, it creates this gorgeous, really fine trailing point, but also holds a lot of liquid. So the, the goat and synthetic are another of my favorites that he makes. This, the, the stiff white synthetic is, is better for my very controlled techniques like I, I'm doing here with the, all the little feathery bits on the breast of this bird. But when I'm doing the more loose style that I do sometimes or when I'm doing background or trailing branches and things, I, I really love the goat hair and synthetic one for that. Is Arch's paper similar to Moulin de Roy? I, let me see, I always forget what the brand is of the other paper I have here. I think I need some Arch's over here. Oh yeah, I do have Arch. I only have the Arch's cold press. Uh, I found colors to be much more muted on the arches, at least for the cold press. I don't, I don't think I had any of the hot press on hand to try testing, so I can't say for certain. But at least with the cold press, colors really sank into it when they dried. So I mean, I would put it, I would brush it on the page, and when it was a wet wash, it was very brilliant colored, but I got kind of frustrated with how the colors just really felt muted and sort of died down as soon as the paint dried. And at first I thought it was my imagination, so I actually did a test where I brushed both on the Moulin de Roy as well as the Arches cold press at the same time with the same intensity when they were wet and when it dried, it was definitely lighter.
Okay, my old favorite before Moulin de Roy used to be the Fabriano Artistico. But that, it didn't get discontinued, but it definitely changed. And so I stopped using it, which also was very sad. But that paper was really, was really bright white. That was one of my favorite things about it, is that it was, I think it was like the brightest white paper that there was, which is important with watercolor to have white, uh, a white page, because that is your lights, that, that's your highlights. So I don't know how these all compare to that now because I haven't ever compared directly. But I know that at least back at, at that time when I was using it, it was most definitely a very noticeable, most bright paper. I'm sorry for ruining your day, Sam. <laughs> but Translucent Mermaid has a point. It's better better to learn about it now than later when you can still when you can still get some. I think someone mentioned to me that there was, hold on, let me see if I can find it, find the link for this. Uh, there is uh, a free sample of Fabriano Artistico soft press. Let's see if I can find the link again. Uh, Savoirfair.com. Yeah, I was going to give this stuff a try also. I hate constantly having to search for new papers. <laughs> in, in the time since I've started first doing watercolors, from all the way back in 1998, I had to switch my watercolor paper uh, because of discontinued product now three times. And it never gets less frustrating because it's so it's so important to have a paper surface that you can rely on and that you know how it behaves and interacts with your paint. I mean, that's such an important element in getting the paint to do what you want. So it always feels like the rug is, is yanked out from under me when I have to figure out what I'm going to be working with next. Um, one of the, the papers that I used before this that I sort of liked was fluid, fluid hot press, but unfortunately they, they don't make the hot press in 300 pound. They only make it 140 pound. Um, so I, I used that for a while and, and I still do that. I mentioned it earlier. I have some 140 pound paper and that that's the stuff that I have. That's 140 pound. It's fluid. And I like them, but I, I definitely like this better. But it's also a, a not too expensive option. So that's another pro in its favor.
think I'm going to be bringing this to be a, to a close shortly because it is supper time. Delicious smells are wafting through the house right now. So I have to emerge from my lair here to see what it is. <laughs> Anyone have any final questions this evening before we call it quits until next week? What about awagami papers or other kozogami kinds of papers? I'm not familiar with those. What, what are those like? <laughs> Glad someone got my little Shop of Horrors reference. <laughs> I have a giant tomato indeterminate vine in my backyard right now that is huge and we we named it Audrey 4 because there was an Audrey 3 at some point as well one year yeah thanks thanks everyone I'm, I'm glad you enjoy them and I will be back next Monday 6 p.m. Pacific time